Okay, I welcome everybody to the to this webinar. Uh, I'm Dave Griswold. I'm the chair of the Lewis and Auburn Community Forest Board, which on the Auburn side of the river is a subcommittee of the Conservation Commission. And we're proud along with the city of Auburn and the help of the city of Lewiston to uh, sponsor this webinar uh, on brown-tailed moth and other invasive insects. Uh, who would have thought three or four years ago that Maine would have a, a brown-tailed moth awareness month in February of this year. Uh, brown tail has been around in the, in the States uh, for almost 100 years, but it's really reared its ugly head in, in Maine and become an issue. So we've asked Allison Canote, who is the state entomologist for the Maine Forest Service, to bring us up to date on where things are and encourage people to look at their trees and take some uh, remedial action uh, this time of year in the winter is the easiest time to identify the nests and take care of them. So Allison, thank you for helping us out and welcome. Thank you, Dave, and, and thank you to the other hosts as well. And, and thanks to our audience for joining us to learn more about brown tail moth during Brown Tail Moth Awareness Month. Um, this was something that came together with support from a, a group, which included folks from other parts of the Maine Department of Agriculture, Conservation and Forestry, um, the University of Maine Cooperative Extension, uh, particularly actually the Androscoggin County area, as well as um, the Maine CDC. And uh, also on our team and not to be ignored is uh, Tom Schmelk, who is the lead for the Brown Tail Moth Program in the Maine Forest Service and our field staff who conduct the work for um, surveying for it. But tonight I'm gonna actually broaden the topic a little bit and also talk about several invasive uh, forest pests that we have either we're looking for in Maine or that we have here in Maine. So I'll include information on the Asian longhorn beetle, which hasn't been found in Maine to date, the hemlock woolly adelgid, beech leaf disease, and emerald ash borer. And I like to start these talks and just recognize that we talk a lot about some insects that do a lot of damage to our forests and also in the case of brown tailed moth to our quality of life. But it is good to step back and remember that we have more than 20,000 species of insects in Maine and that also most of those insects are actually beneficial for us. They're doing things in the environment that are important um, as far as the health of our ecosystems. And it's something that we need to bear in mind as we think about managing brown tail moth, um, you know, making sure that we're keeping in mind the diversity of insects that support the life around us. I could give a long history of brown tail moth, but I'm going to keep it pretty brief. Um, it is a caterpillar moth species that was introduced into Summer Somerville, Mass area in the late 1800s. Um, it was probably came over on live plants. By 1904, it had been established in Maine and the expansion in that early part of the introduction was really quite rapid. And it expanded to include much of New England as well as parts of Maritime Canada and also parts of New York. The population began to, be, to, to collapse by the 1920s and by the 1970s, many believed it would remain just a minor problem of islands in the coast. It had only been found on a couple of islands. And you can see in this map here from Paul Schaefer's work, he was a PhD student at the University of Maine, that by the um, early 70s, it was only found on Cape Cod and the islands around Casco Bay in Maine. However, we know from experience that by the late 1980s, the mainland populations were really beginning to, to pop up. And then by 1994, we were mapping defoliation caused by this pest every year. And we have, since 1994, we haven't seen a year where defoliation visible from a plain has been less than 400 acres. There was a significant outbreak in the uh, late, early 2000s that peaked at around 10,700 acres of defoliation. And then, the brown tail moth populations were quiet for quite a while. 
we saw a buildup start in 2010, and then those that buildup was actually suppressed by diseases in the population and, and potentially some of the wetter weather we were seeing at that time. However, in 2015, the outbreak really did escape those controls. And you can uh, see from this graph that um, the expansion has been really quite rapid of the, this is the area that's capable of being mapped from an airplane um, in the last several years as this outbreak has really built. And it's beyond what we've seen in recent memory. And this maps, these maps here just show our latest survey data. So right now, our crews are out doing winter web surveys. Those, those surveys are not complete, although we have uh, covered a lot of the state already. So the map on the left shows the winter web survey data from 2020, 21 winter, so concluding last March. And you can see that we had webs notably up in a Northern Aroostook County. This is Fort Fairfield down to Monticello and then all the way out to uh, west of Sebago Lake. And I can tell you that this year we have also picked up webs in um, York County as well. And then the map on the right actually shows uh, the um, polygons that were mapped during our aerial survey. So these are taken from a small plane or mapped from a small plane and they show either um, the uh, defoliation that's caused in the May-June period or the damage that's caused by the feeding caterpillars in uh, early, late summer, um, early fall. And so you can see we had um, actually almost 200,000 acres of damage mapped in our aerial survey this year. And so we have this brown tail moth awareness month. Um, it's become abundantly clear as this outbreak has progressed that our past efforts to reach people and to educate folks on measures that can be taken to reduce populations haven't reached far enough. And we need more people to actually participate in managing brown tail moths so that they can save their summers really. Uh, we also want people to plan for how they'll live with brown tail where active management either, either isn't possible or isn't chosen um, because there will be impacts if, if populations are not managed. And we also want folks help in spreading the word and helping their neighbors and encouraging community action. <coughs> Brown tail moth caterpillars, the reason, another reason that we have this Awareness Month, they each have hundreds of irritating hairs on their bodies. And many people will develop skin irritation from encounters with the hairs and some experience even more severe symptoms. And some lucky folks are actually not affected by impacts from the brown tail caterpillar hairs from encounters with the hairs. And the, one of the things about brown tail moth caterpillar hairs is that you can have reactions from them, not just from encountering the caterpillar, but also um, through encountering the hairs that have come off the bodies of the caterpillars. And in heavily uh, impacted areas, they're the quality of life of people living there is really severely impacted as well. Um, we chose February because it gives folks some more time to plan for management of brown tail moth. The caterpillars may break dormancy even in early April. This picture here of the web with the caterpillars on it was taken in mid-April last year. So really pretty, pretty early in that season. If you're going to engage in removing winter webs, doing that before April is generally recommended. You certainly can do it before then though. And to try to simplify the message, we're encouraging people to engage in the four R's this February and beyond to help recognize populations of brown tail moth and to knock them out. And so the four R's are recognize, remove, recruit, and reach out. I'll focus first on recognize. And I hesitate to put in a life cycle diagram, but it is important information when you're dealing with a, a pest. Um, so I'll start right up here at the top. Uh, we have right now caterpillars that are basically in a period of hibernation in the winter webs. These webs are found on the tips of the branches of the hardwood hosts. As I mentioned, they can um, break dormancy 
in early April, they'll start to sun themselves out on those webs. And sometimes they even start to mine the buds of their host trees and shrubs. They will feed and they're gonna molt several times. And each time they molt, they develop more of those toxic hairs. Um, and usually by the end of May, they'll begin to wander and feed really in uh, singles. They're not as uh, clustered as they are in the early part of May. At this point, treatment becomes a little bit more difficult and there's already a lot of hairs in the environment. They're gonna feed generally through June. And then by um, mid to late June, they'll begin to pupate with pupation generally ending by the end of June. Usually by the 4th of July, we have sightings of the first moths coming out and moths will fly throughout the month of July. They'll mate, they'll lay eggs on the undersides of their host trees and shrubs. And those eggs will hatch later um, in the summer. So they generally hatch in August. And then the larvae will feed. They actually skeletonize the leaves. They scrape off the outer surface of the leaf. It causes them to turn kind of a bronze color so that they can be visible when populations are really elevated. And then as they're feeding, they're also building their winter webs. And then they spend all of the winter in those webs. <clears throat> so as I mentioned, the webs are found towards the tips of the branches on hardwood trees and shrubs. You can see them pointed out here in this photograph. And the hosts are pretty variable. They do tend to prefer oaks and fruit trees, things like your apples, cherries, service berries, hawthorns, roses, other things that are in the rose family. But they also will be found on other hardwood trees, elms, birches. We actually had a report from Whitefield of some really heavily infested sugar maples. That's not something that we generally hear a lot about or see a lot of. Um, so really, you know, keep an eye out in any hardwood trees and shrubs. Webs are generally found on the upper and outer portions of the crown, but sometimes, especially in some of these fruit trees, they can be more interior where they're on spur branches. And you can expect to find them at basically anywhere in Maine where there are host trees. And just thinking back to that map, there's areas where they're gonna be more abundant, more likely to be encountered than others. We do have, oh, I apologize, this, the formatting on this got all messed up. Um, we do have some native lookalikes for brown tail moth winter webs. Um, one of them is the Promethea moth. And so this is the cocoon of the Promethea moth shown on the right and outlined in green. It'll be a single cocoon, usually just a single leaf where the caterpillar has wrapped itself up to overwinter. Um, when it emerges in the spring, it'll be this beautiful adult moth, a really important uh, part of our, our native fauna. And then that moth will mate, lay eggs, and develop into this larva. As opposed to the brown tail moth, where a lot of times you have multiple leaves, even fruit, tied up into the webs. One of the things we key into is this bright white silk holdfast that's tying the leaf or leaves to the twig itself. This bright white silk will actually shine in the light on a sunny day. Whereas you can see, it gets a little bit more weathered in the case of the Promethea moth. So we do encourage folks to, to be aware that there are some things that look really similar to brown tail moth and try to avoid removing those. They actually can be held over winter in, in like a, a uh, garage or something uh, for emergence if you do clip out something like the Promethea moth by mistake. So in regards to Brown Tail Moth Awareness Month, talking about that first R, recognize, we encourage you to organize a winter web survey in your community, place of employment, um, your school, your own yard, or any other place. And I wanted to highlight that there is an opportunity coming up in Auburn this Saturday, February 19th at the Mount Auburn Ave side of the Auburn Mall by JC Penney. That's gonna be hosted by the city of Auburn and by the Auburn City Arborist. Moving on to the second R, remove. Um, for removal, we, ask, we recommend that you get permission to remove webs and also to keep an eye for safety. Um, if we do encourage you to remove all webs that you can reach from the ground with pole pruners or um, 
loppers or hand snips. But do be aware that there are some places where it's not going to be safe for um, people who aren't trained to remove those webs. So be aware of hazards like power lines, heavy traffic, um, places where you have to get off the ground to, to remove the webs. In these cases, you might want to hire a professional. In order to destroy the webs, and you can't just remove them and leave them on the ground, you need to destroy them because the caterpillars can still emerge on the, in the spring and find a host plant. We recommend either burning them. This is what I do. I generally put them in the wood stove after I have a maybe a five gallon pail of them um, or uh, you know March is coming up, sugaring season, you can burn them in the arch or you know and get a burn permit from the Forest Service to have a bonfire or a, a warming fire. Um, you can also soak them, but just be aware that these critters have quite a will to live and so, they're also really well protected in that silk. So we recommend soaking them in a bucket with soapy water and really soaking them for a long time, like anywhere from one to three days. Um, and just to be safe, you may also wanna dispose of them in the trash. This is an example of what I use when I'm clipping winter webs. So I don't actually carry duct tape, but it is something that you could do in case you um, encounter the hairs the duct tape can be used to remove them um, from your skin if you feel like you've encountered them. Uh, we do encourage you to cover up your skin, wear gloves, um, you know, protect your eyes so that you don't get exposed to the hairs that are left over from, from the summer generation. Um, we also recommend working with a partner because a lot of times it can be hard to see where those webs fall after you clip them. So a partner can help to pull down the branches. They can help to collect the webs after they're clipped and also help to spot them because they can be surprisingly difficult to see even if you're standing right underneath the tree. I like to carry a five gallon pail with me to fill up with the webs. Um, I've tried other things. I've tried a tote bag. I've tried, you know, paper bags. I've tried a pack basket and I found that the five gallon pail works best for me. Um, I have this extendable um, pole pruner that I use. Um, it is a little bit flimsy, but it's lightweight, which is kind of nice. You don't get as tired. There are some professional grade ones that have multiple extensions you can add to them um, that can reach a little bit higher. This one can only get to about 15 feet. So it's a little bit limited in how far that you can get. I find that loppers are sometimes good for some of the things that are just above head height and then hand snips for stuff that's closer to the ground. And then again, as far as uh, brown tail moth awareness month, um, we would encourage folks to organize a winter web removal com community service event. Uh, we just had one yesterday in Orono at the elementary school where we removed a bunch of webs between the elementary and the high school. Um, encourage you to make it fun, you know, have contests or challenges, a neighborhood block party, you know, sledding, skating, uh, a warming fire, a barbecue, you know, just it's a good way to build community and also to help make your summers a, a little bit more enjoyable as well. Uh, the third R is recruit. Um, we want folks to be aware of when they're out there trying to remove brown tail webs or to treat brown tail webs. Photo actually comes from um, Two. These are actually that were climbing up into the orchard there and removing webs. Um, I don't think that would probably happen now. Um, and uh, and just you know we have we have different standards for safety, I guess, at this point, and and also uh, probably a little bit more litigation in our society at this point. So just be aware of of your limits. Um, of, if you have hazardous situations or high populations, consider hiring a professional. And you can recruit help from tree care professionals that include licensed arborists and licensed pesticide applicators. And we do have lists of both of those on our website um, that we update on an annual basis. As well, um, the Board of Pesticide Control has a list of all the licensed pesticide applicators in Maine. And the Horticulture Program has a list of all the licensed arborists in Maine. So when should you recruit help? I would say as soon as you know that you need it. Um, one of the realities of brown tail moth in Maine is that the 
demand for service from professionals is still higher than the availability of service. Um, so, you know, February may be getting late in some areas. If you have a lot of brown tail moth, that there may be um, not, you know, not a lot of availability of those professional services. But I do know that um, some arborists are still, you know, advertising that they're providing the web clipping services, that they still have capacity to do that, as well as uh, pesticide applicators have said that it's not too late to line up spring help with management. And then I also want to recognize that not everyone will choose to or be able to manage brown tail moth around them. So when those webs are out of reach, it can get expensive to manage those populations. Um, and also some folks would choose not to use pesticides in their environment. And I do want to cover some of the other measures that you can take to help to reduce the impacts of brown tail moth. Um, there are going to be periods and places with intense populations where even these measures will not be enough to alleviate the impacts to your quality of life. And I guess having said that, the ray of hope is that, you know, brown tail moths an outbreak prone species, outbreaks eventually come to an end. This one will as well. And also what we see with brown tail moth is the shifting in the areas where the high populations are. So what can you do to, to help reduce the impact in your lives? You know, you can try to avoid areas that are heavily infested. You know, thinking on the smaller scale, like your landscape, you might reduce your mowing schedule. So there may be, you know, a part of your yard that you usually maintain, but that maybe you only mow it once in the fall. Um, exclude people, pets, livestock from areas with high populations of brown tail moth. Um, there are uh, likely impacts to, to pets and livestock as well as people. Uh, try to avoid outdoor activities during dry and windy conditions. It was really hard these past couple of years when we've been in drought conditions, um, and uh, we're hopeful that we'll have some relief from those conditions. If you are going to go outside, we encourage you to cover up. Um, if you're outside during the active period for the caterpillars, a broad-brimmed hat can help to keep falling caterpillars from off the back of your neck. Um, you might want to consider disposable coveralls for activities that are really going to stir up hairs like mowing or raking and those sorts of activities. Um, if you are going to do like lawn care activities, we encourage you to do it under wet conditions, which is, I know, pretty awful to think about. Um, <laughs> we try to mow our lawns and those sorts of things on drier days for reasons. But in the case of brown tail moth, those wet conditions can help to keep the hairs from uh, becoming airborne. And if you're in an area with heavy populations, you may want to protect yourself with, you know, a respirator and, you know, really making sure that you're covering up your skin. One of the things that we've heard can help to reduce the impact of the hairs is a pre-contact poison ivy lotion that helps to close the pores and reduce their ability to inf infiltrate your skin. We heard from researchers working on brown tail moth that that has helped them. Another thing that you can do is use uh, filters to help reduce the impact of hairs. So sometimes folks want to vacuum up the caterpillars that are crawling on their buildings or their decks. In that case, uh, the shop vac with a HEPA filter can help with that. And we recommend using a uh, wet canister with that shop vac. So you can put um, soapy water right in the canister to help to, um, again, keep those hairs from clogging up the filter. There are also um, allergen reducing screens that have small enough openings to filter out brown tail moth hairs. Brown tail moth hairs are about uh, five one thousandths of an inch long. Um, so they're, they're pretty small, but there are uh, screens, window screens available that are made of that type of material. You know, if, if you're not gonna do that, and I think they're pretty expensive, and just being aware that if you have large trees that are infested near your home, that uh, the hairs can blow from those populations into your home if you have the windows opened. Um, I think I covered those other Other things that we, we encourage is reducing outdoor lighting in July when the moths are flying. It's not going to stop brown tail moth from being in your yard but it may reduce the number of um, migrating moths, moths migrating into your yard. 
um, brown tail moth is like other insect species where if they're in areas with high populations, they may have dispersal flights where they lift up and get carried long distances on the wind and weather. It's part of the reason that we see this um, sort of uh, eastward creep of the infestation uh, with this outbreak is that you know the prevailing winds in July tend to be blowing the the moths uh, down the coast. We don't generally remember, recommend tree removal as a solution to brown tail moth infestation um, because it is a permanent solution for that particular tree. But if you have a tree that's in poor condition or is in kind of a bad place, then it's definitely something to consider. Uh, if you're gonna do that, we generally recommend doing that when the caterpillars are in their webs so that you can also destroy the webs or after they've hatched from their eggs in the, uh, July, August period when they're much smaller and you have a lower risk of exposure. Looking kind of long-term because we know brown tail moth outbreaks will happen again in Maine. As you change the landscape around you, think about trying to work with trees that you can either manage readily through web clipping. So trees that are gonna be smaller form um, or are more easily pruned or species that aren't as favorable to brown tail moth. Um, so I had said that, you know, we have generally we don't see a lot of infestation in maple. We'll only see that in high populations. That tends to be be a good species to uh, to look at. Um, your uh, ericaceous shrubs like your rhododendron, those sorts of things don't tend to have brown tail moth. Magnolia is another one. Um, conifers won't have brown tail moth. I'm not sure about ginkgo. I, I haven't seen it in ginkgo, but it, it's possible. And we'll we'll try to keep on working on developing that list further. And then the final thing we, final R that we cover is, um, you know, reach out, basically encouraging folks to take what they know about brown tail moth and, and help others also learn about it so they can avoid the pain of encounters with the hares. There really is no doubt that brown tail moth is a terrible insect to have to live with. And uh, I hope that we can all work together to reduce the impacts on, on our lives of this, this species. That's what I have on brown tail moth. Um, I also had been asked to talk a little bit about a few other invasive species and I will cover those and then we can come back to questions on brown tail moth um, or any of the other species that are covered. The first one I wanted to highlight is Asian longhorn beetle. Asian longhorn beetle is a really significant tree pest that has not been found in Maine. And most of the infestations of Asian longhorn beetle have been found by the public. Um, the map on the left shows where Asian longhorn beetle has been found in the US. And it's hard to see, but the writing in green is areas where Asian longhorn beetle has been eradicated. So it's one of these pests and they're rare where um, because of the rate of reproduction and, and all of that, it's actually possible to eliminate it from the environment after it's been introduced. And that's been done successfully in several places in the United States, Canada, and Europe. And then in red are areas where Asian longhorn beetle has not been eradicated. And that includes places like Worcester, Massachusetts, also parts of New York where it was first detected in the mid 90s, um, Ohio where it was detected not long ago, and the most recent detection down in um, Hollywood, South Carolina, which is a fairly large infestation that's behaving a little bit differently than Asian longhorn beetle has so far acted in the Northeast. So we do recommend that folks become familiar with this. And if they think they've seen Asian longhorn beetle to report it to our office or animal and plant health, we have a, an easy website to remember, maine.gov slash ALB. And um, you can also find it from our website as well. So these are the known active infestations. As I mentioned, Worcester, Massachusetts is, is the closest one known to us. And then, parts of New York is this is one of the oldest known infestations. So how do you recognize Asian longhorn beetle? Most of what folks see are the beetles themselves. Um, we have 
several lookalikes, but Asian longhorn beetle are large, shiny black insects. Um, they're generally an inch long or so. They're black, like patent leather black shoes, and they have bold white markings on them. So you can see the spots on their wing covers and the stripes on their antennae. As I mentioned, we have a number of lookalikes. They include things like this uh, Northeastern Sawyer, which gets into conifer trees. And there's a ton of other similar looking longhorn beetles that also will get into conifer trees. Um, there's this eyed click beetle, very big insect, black and white, um, that is actually a predatory insect on wood borers. So sometimes you find it near declining trees. Uh, this broad neck root borer doesn't have any of the white markings on it, but it has the long antennae and it bores into the roots of, of trees. A lot of times you'll see them in, in urban areas and they're actually attracted to the to lights as well. So folks will find them on their porch in the morning um, as they've been drawn to the lights at night. And then another one that folks may be seeing in their homes right now is this Western conifer seed bug. It's, it's a bug, it's, it's not even a beetle, but it's frequently mistaken for Asian longhorn beetle. And if people don't recognize the beetle when they're reporting Asian longhorn beetle, sometimes it's the damage that they will notice. Um, I think the first detection in New York, the guy thought that somebody was shooting the trees because they were so full of holes. You can see um, on the left, this is a storm damaged tree shortly after Asian longhorn beetle was found in Worcester, Massachusetts. They had a catastrophic ice storm. And you can see the damage in the inside of the tree that caused failure. So a lot of times you'll see tunneling with Asian longhorn beetle towards the heart of the tree. The other things that folks recognize are the exit holes, which are perfectly round. They're about the same size as, um, the, as a, a tap hole for, for making maple syrup. And then with these exit holes, these perfectly round holes, you also find oviposition niches or egg niches. This is where the adult female would have chewed into the bark to make a place to lay an egg. And these are just a few more pictures of some of the damage um, caused by Asian longhorn beetle. These are all from the Worcester, Massachusetts infestation. So you can see, you know, areas of missing bark tunneling on the outside of the wood, but also going into the wood. Um, and then those exit holes, they're about the diameter of a pencil uh, and perfectly round. So a lot of times we get reports of those lookalike insects and we can't say it is Asian longhorn beetle or it isn't because we really do need to look at the insect to tell. Um, so if you do see an insect, we do ask that you try to capture it, either you know, capture the body itself or even taking a digital picture can be helpful as well. And then report it to that website, maine.gov slash ALB, or you can report it to forresthealth at maine.gov. Um, either of those work and we'll get a person at the other end. Um, moving on to another invasive pest of concern in the Lewiston Auburn area, uh, hemlock woolly adelgid. Uh, we have not detected it in that area. However, we had some really strong evidence of high populations um, and we expect that it may have spread to new areas in the last couple of years with the successive warm winters that we had. I use this photo was actually taken today in, in Rockport um, and just use it to illustrate that uh, hemlock woolly adelgid can be um, sometimes easier to find this time of year because a lot of twigs are littering the ground on top of the snow cover, although they don't have a lot of snow in Rockport at this point, um, and that they are quite visible pieces of the upper canopy of the tree that we keep, usually can't reach. And usually hemlock woolly adelgid will be uh, established first up high in the tree um, because of the way that it's carried to new places. So uh, it's good to take a look at those trees as you see them on the snow this time of year or those, those twigs. This map shows where hemlock woolly adelgid has been detected. I don't believe we had any new detections in 2021. I didn't have a map from 2021 that showed the MDI find from 2020. So um, last year in 2020, we had our first detection in Hancock County that was in the forest. And that was um, on, uh, in Northeast Harbor, I guess. No, it wasn't Northeast Harbor. It was uh, Solmesville. Um, 
And uh, we've had detections in landscape plants in that area before, but never in the forest. And we've had detections on landscape plants throughout much of Maine, actually. So uh, we do know that it's come in in the past on planted trees. Um, but there's a lot of natural spread as well. We have kind of an isolated population known on Dry Island and also around um, Raymond and Standish around Sebago Lake. And it's been found all the way up the coast. Um, with As you get into this uh, further east area, there's much fewer hemlocks in the forest to look at. I suspect it's throughout here as well. It's just not detected at this point. And hemlock woolly adelgid is an interesting insect in that all of the hemlock woolly adelgid in North America are female. And so each one is capable of starting a new population. Um, so especially during March through July, when they have either eggs or the crawlers that come out of those eggs present, those life stages can be moved by birds, by, by mammals, and then also on things like clothing and equipment and by our pets as if we move from a uh, infested forest to one that is not infested. Because of that, we recommend that you prune hemlock back from public spaces, so you're not exposing that vulnerable material to um, arrival of crawlers or eggs, and that you do work in hem hemlock between August and February, because um, at that point, the hemlock's dependent on being on a live hemlock tree, or the adelgid is dependent on being on a live hemlock tree in order to propagate. So if you cut that, that uh, hemlock tree is not going to survive for, to make another generation. The next one may be less familiar to folks. Um, beech leaf disease was detected in Maine for the first time um, last year in June, and it was detected in a fairly widespread area. This is a newer disease of American beech, but also our ornamental beaches as well. And it is caused by, or it's associated with a nematode. The full function of the disease really isn't understood at this point. This time of year, these pictures were taken in hope by one of our technicians. This time of year, the symptoms are seen, this dark banding between the leaves, between the leaf veins can still be seen on the leaves that are either on the forest floor or still attached to the tree. In the summertime, those same dark bands are visible, and you can see them in this upper photo on the right here, um, visible especially when, they're, when you're looking up towards the sunlight in the canopy. Eventually, the, the leaves may become sort of leathery and twisted, and in the fall, or as we approach the fall, the, the uh, banding can become kind of a yellow color. So it shows you the symptoms and the leaves throughout the year. And then the map shows where it was found just in a six month period, or I guess a less than six month period. We found beech leaf disease really um, pretty widespread in the mid coast area, and then an isolated um, detection up in the Penobscot Experimental Forest in Bradley, just north of Bangor. And then the final pest that I'll talk about is emerald ash borer. Um, we're really asking folks to help us with new detections of, em of emerald ash borer. This time of year is a good time to look. Um, we had a detection recently in gray. And the reason that it was recognized was because the person who was walking in the woods noticed um, bark covering the surface of the snow. Um, and then looked up into the ash and could see blonding, which is what we call the symptom that shows up when um, woodpeckers begin feeding on um, the emerald ash borer larvae beneath the bark. They'll, they'll fleck off that outer bark and you'll get bright spots on the trunk. Um, if you were to peel away the bark beneath it, you can actually see the galleries that are caused by the larval feeding of emerald ash borer. And then finally, this picture on the left is um, adult emerald ash borer. They're really pretty small insects, like the size of a black oil sunflower seed. And ways that you can help with detection of emerald ash borer, you know, keep your eyes peeled this time of year for those, uh, you know, the bark on top of the snow or the blonding in the trees, um, indicative of woodpecker activity. 
Um, during the summertime uh, or beginning in the spring, we look for volunteers who are interested in girdling an ash tree, so cutting off that flow of water um, so that the tree slowly dies, it then becomes attractive to emerald ash borer in the area, and it can be a pretty good detection tool. We had quite a number of volunteers this past year spread throughout Maine, and we had um, two positive, two new detections um, due to those trap trees this year. We also will be looking for volunteers to run green funnel traps. Those traps hang in the tree, and you can see this picture here on the right of the trap. They're hung in the tree. There's a collection cup at the bottom, and the material in that collection cup needs to be uh, gathered on an every other week basis. And so it's not something we can really afford to do um, with our personnel. Um, we have had a really successful volunteer program. We had three new detections using that program um, in 2021. Um, so, and then the final way that you could help with emerald ash borer detection would be to monitor a colony of native wasps. And many people might shrink from that idea, but this is a, a non-stinging wasp. This is actually you know, a person's finger. Uh, this is, it's called Cerceris fuma penis. And what it does is it parasitizes uh, metallic wood boring beetles, which emerald ash borer is one of them. This beetle pictured here is not emerald ash borer. It's one of our larger buprestids, um, but they're, they're quite, safe to handle um, and usually it's the peak of summer when we're looking for volunteers to monitor those colonies. I just want to show where we had found emerald ash borer to date. Um, you know we have two distinct areas that are infested. One the first area detected was up in northern Maine um, across from a detection in Edmonston, Canada and then uh, later that same year we had detections and traps in York County. And you can see that the infestation in Southern Maine is really um, spreading pretty rapidly. Our first detection of emerald ash borer was in 2018. So in just four years time, you can see um, how much that population has, has moved, um, or at least the detections of it have moved. And also that it is uh, fast encroaching on um, Androscoggin County and the cities of Lewiston and Auburn. So these are some of the things to look for as far as this time of year, the blonding with emerald ash borer. This is an example of a blonded tree. This uh, tree was in Lyman or is in Lyman. Um, this is what an example of what you find underneath um, areas where emerald ash borer has been feeding underneath the bark. And this example here is you know, something that you can see driving in your car down the road. Um, this particular one I believe was either in Acton or Lebanon. So, you know, in, in pretty far um, Western York County. So at this point, I'd like to open it up to questions. Um, and also I can, uh, I do have some additional slides on some of this information. So if folks have a particular topic they would like to, um, to cover in more detail, we can do that. <coughs> So Dave, did you want me to go through the questions or comments or how do we want to do that? Yeah, why don't you do that? Um, if nobody else has asked, I was, I was wondering about the herbicide treatment for, for brown tail. You didn't touch on that in your yeah. presentation. Yeah, so there are um, a number, number of different insecticides that can be used to control brown tail moth. Um, Unfortunately, uh, with heavy populations, at least in the trials that were done recently by the University of Maine, uh, by Ellie Groden's lab, um, they didn't really find that BTK in their field trials was real effective in reducing populations with a single application. Uh, so BTK is, would be sort of have the least impact to other insects in the environment because it is a caterpillar specific insecticide. And it's one that needs to be ingested by the caterpillar in order to be active. And it's also has a very short uh, lifespan on the foliage. <clears throat> so they found that that, was, that would reduce populations, but oftentimes not enough to the point where people would feel, would get relief from the irritating hairs. Um, there are a number of other uh, 
products that can also be sprayed on the foliage to help control brown tail moth. A number of towns have used spinosad, um, which is a broad spectrum insecticide. It kills a lot of different kinds of insects. It does have a, um, a shorter uh, lifespan on the tree than some of the other ones that you can spray on your, fo your foliage so that can be sprayed on foliage. Um, and one of the reasons that towns often use it is because it does have an organic label as well as a conventional label. <clears throat> Another uh, way to control with pesticides is using things that are systemic in the tree so that they're either injected or put on the soil or uh, any, uh, or also there's one product that's used as a, as a drench on the bark. And um, those ones have varying uh, residency within the tissues. So you have everything from something like acephate, which is a, it's an organic phosphate, organophosphate. It's a kind of an older chemistry that uh, is pretty quickly broken down to something like uh, emamectin benzoate that can last for 18 months or more in the tree. And with those, there's a broad range of, of costs as well. But in general, we do recommend folks work with a licensed pesticide applicator uh, for management with insecticides because brown tail moth is a really complicated beast and pesticide labels are really complicated publications as well. So understanding them and using pesticides properly can be challenging. So I'm gonna go through uh, some of these questions. We have one, um, they have a summer property that's not accessible from late October to early April due to road access. Is injection the only option or can webs be removed in mid to late April if a professional can get to the property? That's probably gonna be um, really a question to ask of the professionals that you talk to. So I would go ahead and call some of the arborists on that list and see, see whether they are willing to, because it does increase their exposure to the hairs. And um, I don't, I can't, won't, don't know enough about their individual businesses to know if that's something that they would do. Um, you know, injection is an option, as I mentioned, foliar application is of insecticides is another option. Uh, another question about injection. Um, so, what do I know about chemically injecting trees to treat? As I mentioned, there's a number of different active ingredients that can be used. Um, most products are not available to homeowners. Um, many companies will only sell to commercial pesticide applicators. The only one that I know of that is available to homeowners is a acephate product and um, it's called Dendrex. And it's, it's not, I would say it's probably not foolproof <laughs> um, and something that you'd wanna do your research if you were going to investigate using that yourself. I would certainly download and read the label before doing that. Make sure that you're comfortable with what it's telling you to do. Uh, another one, do we have a plan to eradicate brown tail moth? Um, no, brown tail moth is not one of those insects that can be eradicated. I had talked about Asian longhorn beetle where there have been successful, successful eradications of that pest. Um, and in the case of brown tail moth, we, we just don't have the tools to eradicate it. Uh, um, somebody wants to hear about creative uh, options for uh, managing brown tail moth in taller trees. Uh, they'll clip and burn the trees, the shorter trees. Um, they had a caterpillar conga line going down the edge of the roof gutter last year. Um, you know, so for those taller trees, of course, there's insecticides. There's, there's actually a company that's just uh, purchased a drone. There are, um, for mechanical removal of webs, there are, um, sorry, I got distracted. Uh, <laughs> No, I, I lost it. <laughs> so uh, for those taller trees, um, pretty limited options. So pesticides, there is the drone. I remember what else I was gonna say. Uh, the other 
arborists. There are many that have uh, lifts that can get very high up into a tree. You have to recognize that this sort of work, whether it's drone or pesticide or um, work with a professional arborist, it's all gonna be, um, it's gonna come at a price, um, but it, it can uh, make a difference. Dozens of oaks would be a very high price as far as that's concerned. Uh, we do recommend folks uh, focus their management in areas with um, a lot of human activity and then also just see if you can um, reduce activity in some of those areas where it can't be managed. Uh, Christine asked about the best time to inoculate trees against boundtail moth and the answer is that it's going to depend on um, what sort of products are used. Uh, let's see, um, more images. No, has the Forest Service considered recommending businesses turn off floodlights overnight to avoid attracting moths? Um, you know, we we encourage people to turn off their lights. We we uh, really have not gone further than that. Um, definitely see them attracted in great numbers near uh, places with lots of lights. Um, but I think a lot of times for purposes of insurance and whatnot, businesses can have a hard time with turn, turning off their lights. Uh, more images of brown tail moth for identification purposes. Um, I do have some of those, I think. Um, so, you know, again, the ends of the branches. Uh, let's see. Where were those? There we go. So let me get back there. So fall webworm is one that folks often will mistake for brown tail moth. Um, a lot of times it's at the ends of the branches. Sometimes it can encompass a whole tree even, especially on like your ash trees and those sorts of things. They tend to be really loose, messy webs this time of year and they're often football size or larger. Eastern tent caterpillar, and I'm afraid I don't have a good picture of Eastern tent caterpillar in winter at this point, but they tend to be down at the crotches of the branches where the branches come together. And um, again, sort of similar to fall webworm, they tend to be really loose and messy this time of year. The silk of brown tail moth is gonna be pretty strong um, and, and thick for the most part. I had mentioned already the native silk moths. So there's two different examples of two different species of silk moths on this slide. And then the brown tail moth webs, as I mentioned, it's gonna have that bright white silk holding it on. Um, <laughs> that too can weather with time. I live on a dirt road and I say that the silk on the brown tail moth webs is not as bright as in these pictures when it's exposed to the dirt and grit of a dirt road and probably more urban areas as well. Um, but in general, you'll have that really strong multi-layer hold fast holding the web to the twig. And just a few more examples of the webs. You know, a lot of times there'll be multiple attachments of a single web on the twigs. Um, this example down here in the lower right shows that sometimes they can be pretty tricky to see. Sometimes it's just a single leaf. And a lot of times folks can be tricked by um, their oak trees in particular, where a lot of times they only look like leaves that have been held on, um, which is really typical for oaks and also apples as well. One of the things, if you have a web down at the ground, um, you can actually pull it apart and see the caterpillars inside it. And each web can have you know, anywhere from a couple dozen to more than 400 caterpillars in it. And this just shows a single web and the caterpillars that have emerged from it. And there's an example at the top of an oak tree. Uh, let's see. How far can the hairs travel? So the hairs are microscopic. They can probably travel very long distances. Um, we definitely recommend if you're near infested areas that you don't dry your clothes on the line. Um, as far as the question about kids playing in the yard, um, you know, on those dry, windy days, you want to avoid that in areas that are heavily infested. 
Uh, let's see, Kath asks about emerald ash borer images um, and showing those again. So here's an example. I think this, maybe this is the one. Um, it shows uh, the blonding, the galleries beneath the bark, and then, you know, more intense blonding. And um, there's the, the beetles. They're kind of really tapered. They'll be present from June through um, basically your first hard frost in the summer. Um, Uh, so question about clipping webs can be expensive. Are there state programs that help private landowners or municipalities with the cost of removal? Um, not at this point. Uh, at this point, there is a bill in front of the legislature that would provide some funding to offset costs to towns and, and also potentially um, provide grants to nonprofits as well. But it's, it's uh, $150,000 and um, probably make some small difference in, in folks being able to engage. A question that I wanna make sure to address, does ACE cap work on brown tail moth? Uh, it does, however, it's not legal to use it in Maine right now because it's not registered in Maine. Um, unfortunately, that's the choice of the, of the company and uh, there is an annual registration that needs to happen for pesticides. And you can actually see which pesticides are registered by going to the um, Board of Pesticide Control website. Uh, it's easy to remember. It's think first, spray last. And um, it is, uh, they have a, a link to a database that shows which pesticides are, are registered. Um, how long can an outbreak last? Um, I guess we know that we're still on the building edge of this outbreak. Um, we believe that what is going to help to collapse the outbreak is going to be one of a couple of things. Um, one would be to have um, some significant spring moisture. Um, so the drought conditions that we had in the spring the last couple of years have been really good for caterpillars of all sorts of species. But uh, wet, with wet temp weather, not wet temperatures, <laughs> wet weather can help to promote disease in the populations. And um, that's what can help to bring about the collapse of an outbreak. Another thing that can help bring about collapse of the outbreak is um, poor host quality. And so if the trees get stressed enough that they're no longer good food for the caterpillars, um, then the outbreak can also collapse because of that. And um, they do believe that uh, what is now being called spongy moth, it used to be called gypsy moth, um, may have been partially responsible for part of the collapse of the outbreak that happened in the 19 teens and 20s because it just ate everything and um, helped made it so that there wasn't a lot available for brown tail moth. Uh, let's see. Um, how many years of defoliation can a healthy tree tolerate? And so generally, uh, if everything else is going well for a tree, it can, a hardwood tree can uh, tolerate two to three years of defoliation before you start to get large branch mortality. That's a tree that's got other things going for it, like plenty of moisture, so it's not in a drought condition. Uh, soils that aren't compacted, so healthy roots, um, and uh, not, not having other stressors like disease or other defoliators. Unfortunately, we have um, a lot of compounding factors with the trees here in Maine right now with the drought and also with a number of other um, forest health issues going on. Uh, Susan asks, how can we find companies that will use drones? As far as I know, there's only one in Maine uh, that has uh, purchased a drone for use for clipping webs. Um, there, I know that companies have also investigating using drones for pesticide applications. So for a more targeted application of the uh, foliar sprays, but I don't believe anybody is actually taking that next step of uh, figuring out how to do it. Um, uh, let's see, it's obviously a serious problem. Is there a government program to help? Uh, I guess I, I kind of covered that one already that there really is not at this point. 
brown tail moth is a serious problem. It's a really serious problem in Maine, um, but for the rest of the world, it's not much of a problem. And so there's not a lot of resources that have gone into, you know, understanding its life cycle or, um, you know, or providing help on managing it. Uh, CMS, how much of the increase in brown tail moth population is attributable to climate change? Is the expectation that this will continue to get worse if our average temperature gets warmer? And um, you know, we, we can't say definitively that it's uh, that all of this outbreak is related to climate change, but um, we do know from research that was done by the university that um, warming temperatures in uh, the, the late August, early September period are correlated with uh, increases in population of brown tail moth as seen by the acres defoliated. Um, so we do expect, we expect that they're able to go into the winter more robust, you know, healthier in those warmer fall periods. And so potentially able to have better survival and uh, overwinter, overwinter better. The other thing that uh, that same research uncovered was a correlation between wetter springs and population declines. So, you know, if we have increased periods of drought, that can can be potentially a problem as far as having increased outbreaks of brown tail moth. <coughs> um, let's see, Dana asks, can you offer any advice for relief when getting the brown tail moth rash? You know, it's, it's all about treating the symptoms. And if you ask 20 people, they'll tell you 20 different answers. And we have asked, you know, our partners at CDC and they say, you know, they advise us not to provide specific recommendations because different people can have reactions to some of those, those home remedies. Um, but there's a lot of uh, advice out there on the web, I can tell you. And, and generally it's treating the symptoms. Certainly, if you um, experience a uh, severe reaction, you know, if you have difficulty breathing, you know, dial 911. Um, or if you have a rash that doesn't abate, then getting in touch with your physician. Um, there are some prescription, um, excuse me, lotions that can be, I've heard, helpful in uh, combating the rash. So Tony asks, is it safe to eat vegetables that caterpillars have crawled over? Um, I would be careful in eating vegetables that you can't wash thoroughly. If you're going to cook vegetables or peel them, um, or you can wash them well, then it shouldn't be a problem. Um, and it's not so much the caterpillars crawling over them as vegetables grown underneath uh, canopies that are full of brown tail moth and the hairs shedding off of them. Uh, question, can brown tail moth kill oak trees? And the answer is that it can in periods of outbreak, and especially if there are other stressors that the trees are experiencing, you know, especially things like you know, drought is really a significant stress to trees, and drought plus defoliation can, can be pretty, pretty damaging to them. You know, we had a, a really big outbreak we, this past year in 2021, of that spongy moth or, or gypsy moth. We had more than 55,000 acres defoliated. You know, normally you'd expect the trees to be able to bounce back after a, a year or two of defoliation, um, but with the severe drought conditions that we've had, I, I think that we're probably gonna see a more rapid decline in, in the forest than we would expect under, under best conditions. I think that's all the questions. Well, we're just about to, up to the hour, so the timing was great. Uh, if there aren't any other questions, here's the information on the field session that we're gonna, gonna do on Saturday over at the mall from 10 to 11.30. Uh, Noel Skelton is gonna be hosting that. I'm sure I'll be over there as well. We've got some crab apples that are easy to see and easy to uh, prune. So we'll uh, give people an opportunity to do some of that. Uh, I wanna thank Allison for helping us put this on. Uh, it's, it's great to be able to use the resources that uh, your department provides. 
and we're we've done some work on emerald ash borer monitoring here in in the Twin Cities. We'll probably continue to do that next summer. And I hope that everybody that uh, tuned in uh, got something out of this and will help spread the word to your friends and neighbors. So uh, even if we can't eliminate it, which I doubt if we can, at least people will have a better understanding of how to deal with it if they do have it uh, close by. Yeah, thank you, Dave. And, and thanks to, again, for folks showing up.